Welcome everyone. Today is the International Day of Persons with Disabilities. And this year's theme is building back better towards an inclusive, accessible and sustainable post COVID-19 world by, for and with persons with disabilities. And people with disabilities are disproportionately affected by the health and social economic consequences of the global pandemic. And in this context, this year's theme emphasizes the importance of strengthening our collective efforts for universal access to essential services, including health and social protection, education, digital infrastructure, accessible information, unemployment, and so on. So that persons with disabilities are not left behind in this time of crisis. Now, before we continue, please note that there are language options. If you click on the globe on the lower right of the Zoom screen, there will be an option for English, Spanish, and French. And we also have some sign language interpretation. Many thanks to the city of Leon in Mexico for providing this today. You will also notice a Q&A button, and I encourage you to submit your questions there throughout the, this panel discussion. We hope uh, to find time during our panel to answer some of your questions. And lastly, if you face any technical issues, please message uh, in the chat, and hopefully our technical team will be able to help. Uh, UNESCO has had a week of events marking this day. Our panel today is called the Disability Inclusive Response for COVID-19 Through Open and Distance Learning. And our panelists will share their experiences and thoughts on the matter. And we also hope during the conversation to also consider UNESCO's recommendation on open educational resources, which was adopted uh, at the UNESCO General Conference last year. Let me quickly do an introduction uh, of our panelists. We have Mayor Hector Lopez Santillana, who is the mayor of the city of Leon, Mexico since 2015. And he has lived and served in the community in different ways over the course of 50 years. Uh, this has included attracting foreign investment to the region, working to build sustainable economic development and working in education. And under his mayorship, the city of Leon received the Building Equality Award for its achievements in the social inclusion of people with disabilities. And the city is also a member of the UNESCO Coalition of Inclusive and Sustainable Cities. We also have Professor Alan Tate. He is Professor Emeritus of Distance Education and Development at the Open University in the UK and the former Director of International Development and Teacher Education there. And he was also with the International Council for Open and Distance Education also in the UK. And we have Professor Yuta Treviranus from the OCAD University in Toronto. And she is the Director and Founder of the Inclusive Design Research Center and the Inclusive Design Institute. Next, we have Professor Diane Chambers, who is the Coordinator of Special and Inclusive Education and Associate Dean of Research at the School of Education at the University of Notre Dame in Australia. And finally, last but not least, we have Mr. Vashkar Bhattacharjee, who is the Program Manager at Young Power in Social Action in Bangladesh, and he is Laureate of the UNESCO Amir Jabber Al Ahmad Al Jabber Al Sabah Prize for digital empowerment of persons with disabilities. So welcome everyone uh, to this discussion. I'm going to start with the mayor, uh, Mayor Santillana. You've had to deal with the panoply of issues during the pandemic, uh, how to get people to work, how to convince people to work from home, education, public health, of course. And you've talked about making sure uh, that no one is left behind. So how did your office work to be sure persons with disabilities in the city were being taken care of in this most unusual year? Thank you, Melissa. First of all, I would like to say that for us, it's an honor to be invited to this web seminar. I hopefully will learn a lot from the specialists that are also participating during this web seminar. For us, first, uh, is our conviction, conviction, but it's simple, but it's clear, to make Leon a safe and inclusive city, leaving no one behind and including everyone in development. This is the basis for a society to live in peace and harmony. So we have transformed ourselves as a government to serve people with disabilities. Break, breaking the bureaucratic schemes with a humanistic government that reaches everyone. For example, we have implemented a special service, a special 
transportation service for people with disabilities to, to provide free service for access them to therapies, education, work, and healthcare. We also have created 15 formal educational institutions for children with disabilities in Leon, granting over 2,000 scholarships to these students. We have created a special municipality service with no lines program. That means that through the phone line, they can reach all the bureaucratic services that they will need to access their special programs. So also we have a multiple attention center with basic rehabilitation junior in the suburbs. So with these forms, we are trying to support, to provide them all the services that they are need or they need during their daily life. But also when it comes to employment, we have created a special uh, uh, testing or a special certificate program that uh, allowed us to identify their abilities to reach an, up, uh, an employment. And especially for instance, uh, our emergency call center, uh, open vacancies for people with disabilities. We care about raising awareness among employers, and we have put people to work even during the pandemic within inclusive companies. In the civil uh, uh, environment, we have 12 civil associations in place that address disability issues or have adopted programs or services into their vision. Finally, we have incorporated our citizens' vision into public policies by utilizing, using directives, executives, volunteers, and citizens to join campaigns such as Corazón de León, Lion's Heart, with the guidance of the Special Institute uh, in Goodies, which is uh, uh, aimed to understand disability issues and design inclusive public policies, which will lead us to continuous development development in favor of becoming a more inclusive city with no precedents in the region. Mayor, can I pursue um, another question with you and ask if you can talk a little bit more in detail about the education angle of it, um, how the city has managed to use, for example, technologies and the fact that we've all had to operate virtually when it comes to education. We are working to develop our city as a smart city, but using technology at the service of the most vulnerable people. We understand that technology is a media for can we support our people. So in that way, we are creating an inclusive, inclusive citizen culture. Uh, by the way, uh, designing especially areas, blue areas, increasing fines for those for those people who are not respecting these places, uh, special courses for sign language, as you can see in this moment, and uh, the adaptation of uh, the, to the Braille system. So other uh, programs that we are uh, encouraged to uh, promote education is uh, that we have been translating, if we allowed me to say in that way, adapting uh, to virtual programs, all the programs that we use during the normal times as the summer camps, education, drawing classes, and services, for instance. Uh, another example that I am so proud of this program is uh, how can we keep our therapies programs um, uh, using the, this technology to provide the physical and emotional and personalized services at home with educational services uh, advisors, sorry, advisors present in their homes for those who do not have internet access. And another way that we are supporting our people is a special digital citizens consultation for people with disability. Ask them what they need. We need to listen to them we are not at a paternalistic welfare, neither populistic government. 
the pandemic and the use of the technology have allowed us to reach people we, we have not reached before. Many of these practices will remain permanently during, mm. uh, after the pandemic. Yeah, it's very interesting what you talk about in terms of the need for building out that digital infrastructure. We're definitely going to return to that theme in a moment. I want to turn to Professor Tate uh, at this moment. You've talked a lot in your work about the reality of students' lives. And of course that reality has changed a lot uh, all around the world this past year. Open and distance learning uh, existed before COVID-19, but how is it adapted to the reality of, of learning in a time of COVID? And Professor Tate, I, you're, I think you're on mute, if you can unmute. Oh, thank you, thank you, Melissa. Okay. And um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to friends and colleagues around the world. It's a great privilege to be able to contribute to this UNESCO webinar. Um, and thank you to Mayor Leon for his interesting comments. Yes, well, open and distance learning um, has, I think, since the COVID lockdown, which began here in the UK in March, as it did, I think, in many parts of the world, um, been somewhat put into the spotlight as a model of good practice. And indeed, if we look around the world, at, for example, the more than 80 open universities, they've based themselves on a philosophy of student-centered learning, that is to say, we build our systems to meet the needs of our students. And so where we are um, discussing the ways in which we support students with disability, we're guided most of all by a social model of disability, that is, you're regarded as our responsibility to develop ways to support differently abled students so that they're not disabled by how we organize ourselves. And that has resulted, for example, in the Open University in the UK having more students with disabilities than all the other universities in the UK put together. Open and distance learning is of course based on the idea of home-based study supported by technology and so it has done remarkably well in supporting its students um, in lockdown because our students can continue studying by and large in the same ways. The big challenge I think has been for us as it has been for many many educational institutions in how we organize assessment where that includes um, uh, end of course face-to-face -face examinations, that has been a challenge and difficult. Well, that is a big contrast with what has happened on campuses in the high-income countries and the middle-income countries, as well as the low-income countries. And here, in the high- and middle-income countries, we've had an emergency response, essentially doing remote campus-based teaching, which has been a very variable quality, I must say. But in low-income countries, it's meant the closure of campuses altogether, so the impact has been from the devastating to the middle quality at best. Um, and I think um, I'd, I'd want to say that um, the reputation of open and distance learning may in due course be damaged by the poor experience of students mm. who have been working on campus, but locked up and having all their lectures and seminars on Zoom. So uh, what I hope very much is that one of the positive outcomes, and there are few, of this COVID pandemic will be that all educational institutions will revisit how they build their learning, teaching and student support systems around student needs, uh, whether it be students with disability or whether it be students of any sort. In fact, we mainstream student needs rather than put the issues for students with disability out in one particular category. So I think there could be some very positive outcomes from this. Uh, that is very interesting consideration. Uh, Professor Trevirianus, um, I wonder what you think about what Professor Tate has said about uh, his concern uh, that um, student experiences being less than ideal will actually have a, a, a negative impact on uh, open and distance learning. And then, and then in turn, I also want to ask you a second question, uh, which is uh, particularly because of your experience in technology, to what extent you, you've noticed that um, technology um, has included and considered people with um, disabilities in this year. Yeah, so I, I, um, I very much like the comment regarding not taking a paternalistic view, but uh, 
uh, consulting with individuals with disabilities regarding what the needs are and drawing people uh, that have experience of disability into the, the area of co-designing that uh, the mayor has mentioned. Um, in terms of the um, disparate effect of the, of the pandemic, I think it exists both in um, more developed countries and underdeveloped countries. I think one of the, the issues that we've seen is that the assumption is made that if uh, one particular group of, of people with disabilities is served, then everyone is served. And so we're, we're seeing a disparity, not just in every country, but also between one group of individuals with disabilities and another. And so the marginalization of um, students that may not have the right bandwidth, that may be in a large family, that may not have a place where a computer is available, um, that uh, the one of the issues that we faced in the ecosystem of technology for people with disabilities is that often segregated separate assistive technologies are relied upon and those may be available at school but they may not be available at home and they tend to be far more expensive because they're niche or they're not available in many developing countries and so is this inequality uh, within every group and within every country and the certainly um, and I uh, open systems are far better uh, at left out or uh, marginalized in, in this way, whether it's for economic reasons, but also things like open education resources allow for the creation of variants so that you can have uh, a lesson that is presented in multiple ways. Right. Uh, open technology means that there is the opportunity to translate, to make it available in alternative languages, um, but also to uh, add on to, uh, systems and features that may not be available by the original manufacturer. Um, open universities as well, because they have been trying to uh, accommodate or to serve a much broader group of students tend to be far more accessible and uh, push back against that marginalization. I think one of the things we've learned is that everything that we've done that it, um, supports accessibility and supports students and educators with disabilities is serving everyone right now <laughs> since we're all sort of online. And I think the lesson here, uh, which pushes against some of the political messaging that is happening globally, is that if we build our systems such that they work for students and educators um, that have disabilities or in other ways marginalized, we create systems that are far more resilient and that serve us when mm. we're in a situation when we feel vulnerable and there are um, issues facing us. So uh, the, I'm hoping that by building back, we take that lesson as opposed to the lesson of uh, let's take care of the majority and not worry about the weak until later. Um, we need to integrate, uh, request the co-design and participation of people that have ex lived experience of marginalization. Right, and I love how you uh, brought it back to uh, the, this year's theme, Build Back Better. And I also noticed that Professor Chambers, you've been nodding your head quite a bit uh, during uh, Professor Trevor Ranus' uh, uh, comments. So uh, I, I want to go to you uh, to see if you have any additional comments uh, to what uh, everyone has said so far. Mm -hmm. And then I do have a follow-up question for you, which is um, how this year has informed you moving forward when it comes to the UNESCO Open Education Resources recommendation. Great, thank you. And thank you for um, letting me be part of this uh, fantastic webinar. Um, so I, I very much agree with what uh, Yuta was saying and Alan as well. Um, <clears throat> we have seen similar um, things happen, but we've seen that even before COVID too. So a lot of the strategies and the, the processes we use for students with disabilities in the classroom actually benefit most of the students in the classroom. So it's not even just the technology, it, it's just in general, they're, they're good pedagogy, you know, so, so using those strategies in, in a broad way is a fantastic idea. Um, we have also seen where 
you know, definitely um, Alan was talking about student experience as well. And we've seen that uh, I, we have universities here that are purely face-to-face -face universities who have had to, within one week, uh, change the entire structure and the way that they do things. So we've been doing some research around that as well. And uh, definitely the environmental aspect. I know Yuta was talking about that. Um, you know, access to, to technology, access to a quiet place to study without four or five siblings jumping on top of you. All of those things are incredibly important to the experience as well. Um, <clears throat> one thing uh, to answer your question about um, how the year has informed us moving forward, mm -hmm. uh, definitely the rapid shutdown of regular systems or known systems or systems that people were familiar with has been um, causing a lot of consternation obviously around the place. So what it has done is provide opportunities and what I have seen is growth and particularly growth in um, teachers, growth in university lecturers and even growth in students. So the, the necessity to actually use and explore, devise new technologies you know, things that, that are actually working for them in the classroom, uh, things like the uh, open education resources, which are readily available, um, things like that, um, definitely timely um, for UNESCO in regards to their recommendation for those open education resources. Uh, it couldn't have come at a better time. There's so much out there now. And I've seen a number of teachers actually go and, for example, the OER Commons, um, there's four and a half thousand resources in mathematics in that mm. particular um, resource. And some of those are very interactive. Uh, quite a few of them are very relevant for students with disabilities, um, particularly different types of disability. So those open educational resources have really come to the fore in that current climate. Mm. Uh, teachers are really trying to find ways and they really are desperately trying to find ways to include all of their students in the classroom. Um, I'm, I've been constantly getting, you know, phone calls and emails from teachers really wanting to know and to learn more. So this can only be beneficial in the long run in that we're really upskilling some of those teachers who, you know, the capacity um, of schools and teachers and systems to actually make excellent changes and probably long lasting changes too. Great, thank you. Mr. Vashkar Bhattacharya, thank you so much for your patience. Um, in Bangladesh, where you are, I understand that uh, approximately one in every 10 persons experience at least some kind of disability. And you've always made it very clear that you are one of approximately 4 million Bangladeshis uh, who are visually impaired. So you've overcome tremendous challenges. And I'm curious, um, from your standpoint, how has education been disrupted for students with disabilities in Bangladesh during this COVID period? Vashkar, I believe you're on mute. I, at least I can't hear you on my end. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. So thank you very much for um, UNESCO for uh, inviting me for for today's panel and I'm really grateful to you as you have count Bangladesh, country like Bangladesh who have lots of challenges for education of persons with disabilities and you are counting us and you want to listen our voice. You know, um, we, in our country, uh, uh, education system have divided in three, three uh, types of education we are implementing in Bangladesh. One is a special education where um, the education system is totally maintained by the Ministry of Social Welfare. And another is a, a integrated education. That means uh, students live in a hostel environment and they, um, uh, they are going in a mainstreaming school. And third one is like inclusive education. Uh, children with disabilities are going in their nearest school. So um, when these lockdown situations um, um, came and maximum school has uh, closed uh, within in the, in the mid of the um, March 2020, um, maximum my students left the hostel without their books because they never thought that they they will be um, there will be a big interruption in the education because there was no no experience. We never ever ever even believed that um, everything would be closed for a long time. So even they didn't carry their uh, accessible uh, their books like uh, printed books. You know when there is a braille books, is lots of books are there. 
So um, we really, in the beginning, there was a lot of a struggle for the children with disabilities in Bangladesh, but we have tried to overcome because, you know, um, uh, because of the Digital Bangladesh Initiative, uh, that was one of the initiative of Bangladesh government. And you'll be very happy to know, I am also working with the government as a national consultant accessibility. So I was closely working with the government to overcome the challenges during COVID pandemics. Um, education, how we can make the education inclusive and accessible for all. So um, as we have innovated several technology, uh, accessible books, digital books, um, that was really helpful. Even though that book was uh, innovated long time ago, we didn't know that there will be some pandemics will come, but this digital book became very, very useful for the children with disabilities. And uh, government has dedicated a television channel. Uh, there is a TV channel uh, only for the uh, taking classes. Uh, um, um, that is really very helpful for the children with disabilities. And we have trained up uh, the teacher um, for making the class inclusive through television channel. Um, uh, like such as uh, they are using, when they are speaking, they are using text, they are giving presentation. So there is a multimedia presentation. When they write something, they are same time speaking. So there is some kind of orientation we have given to the teacher. Then they, they, that's why children with disabilities are able to receive the educational uh, uh, content easily. Secondly, we found there is many children with disabilities who don't have television or who are really in a rural part of the country. So government was decided to make some uh, radio content and we have developed number of radio content um, uh, with the support of even UNESCO, Bangladesh office also was involved with A2I and Ministry of Education, Ministry of Primary Education. So community radio and, and uh, local radio service, they have here on all the content. And as we, as I told you, like we have distributed thousands of um, uh, accessible book reader and a smartphone for children with disabilities, um, mm -hmm. student with disabilities previously um, as part of uh, digital empowerment. Um, even you'll be very happy to know, um, when I was received uh, UNESCO prize 2018, um, in that time I was donated my uh, total uh, 20,000 US dollar for making some accessible books. That was uh, really, I feel um, glad that, that books are now very useful for the children with disabilities. So um, we have tried our level best to overcome the challenge, but still, you know, Disability is a diverse, diversified issues. There's right. not only blind people, there is child sign language user, there is in disability. So everyone is facing difficulties. Still there's a lot of difficulties, but we are trying to overcome within our limited resource. Thank you. Would you be able to talk a little bit more? I'm, I'm, in, I'm interested because the mayor had also referred to this earlier about uh, the need to build out digital infrastructure. And you talk about the fact that there are students who didn't even have a television. Um, what are some of the things that you'd like to see in Bangladesh in terms of building out the digital infrastructure? What are the tools that uh, students with disabilities need, uh, Mr. Bhattacharjee? You know, we have innovated some low cost technology that is, we call accessible book reader. Based on low cost Android phone, we have developed some apps by which a student with disabilities can read their books. Um, uh, we are pro providing books within that device, which are very cheap and um, government are freely distributed among 2000 children with disabilities in 2020, in 2019. Even though we didn't know that there was uh, corona pandemics will come but these devices are highly uh, useful for children with disabilities. We really need to innovate some technology which are cheap, locally available, and also we don't need like electricity types of things, uh, even internet connectivity is a challenge. So we need to identify some solution, such, such as community radio is a very good tool. You know, community radio, we have some community radio in an island, in a char, so where no internet, no, um, uh, connectivity. Its community is playing vital role for disseminating educational information. But again, radio is not accessible for everyone, such as uh, sign language users are not able to access radio. So still there is a challenge, but we are trying to accommodate. We cannot stop, you know. We need to, um, uh, uh, always we need to explore all the possible solutions. I would like to recommend 
we need to identify the indigenous knowledge and indigenous technology, which are locally available. We need to identify these types of technology. And this corona pandemic teaches us how to overcome challenge, how to survive within the pandemics. And I really became happy to see many people with disabilities are now using technology, smartphone, internet, even though they never ever touch it before the pandemics, because they are now bound to do that. Even though they have lack of uh, ability to buy, but some of them are getting from government, some of them are getting from the local donation, et cetera, but they're trying to get it one. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Santillana, if I could uh, circle back to you then. Um, you mentioned the need for digital infrastructure. It's been very interesting to hear what Mr. Bhattacharya has said. Uh, as mayor, what are you thinking about in terms of the need to build out infrastructure in 2021 and beyond so that people with disabilities but also other citizens uh, can, can sort of uh, use this technology to their advantage to be able to continue working and also to be able to continue learning. As we can, uh, as we are learning during this web seminar is that the main challenge is to break down techno technological barriers and to develop the skills to use it. So what we are trying that we have started to do it as a level of municipality, first of all, is investing resources to develop the service, the, the technological services. So we are providing free internet access, especially in the rural areas. Actually, we have reached 60% of our rural areas in the municipality of Leon, that, that means uh, roughly uh, reaching or providing the service to 80,000 people who have never used in this, this technology. What we are starting is that we are providing in free internet access in 100% of our urban transportation system. That services began just this Monday. So what we are expecting is that our students, our people with disabilities, using their time, their transportation time, or using the time that they are waiting for the bus to have been connected, to using that time to, to develop the, their studies or to reach the services that they are needed. I am so proud of these services because these services is provided by the local businessmen, the, the, the entrepreneurs that they have the, the, the responsibility to provide the transportation system service. So uh, we also have a special transportation for people with disabilities. It's another free services. All these services are being supported by the municipality budget. You know, we have not the enough uh, financial resources to deal with this uh, uh, challenge. But they are trying to do uh, what we can do. We cannot cross our arms. We cannot be indifferent to this challenge. We have to do in order to support our, our people. And in the near future, we are waiting or we are expecting to receive support from the other Levels, levels of government. Meanwhile, we are using or we are making an alliance with the local businessmen to provide these services. Uh, another special uh, issue is that uh, we are providing services to our people, trying to avoid to be present in the uh, bureaucratic offices. We are developing new uh, digital services to our people with disability, especially, but also for the rest of our population. And of course, we are providing training. We are providing a, a special programs to develop these skills, to, to teach how to deal with this technology, to use it in a better way. And of course, 
we are trying, or we are using our young population to support other people, especially our uh, uh, people with disabilities. Our young population is a strength in our country. So we are using these uh, this, uh, cap capacities to support each other. So what we are trying to avoid is that everything will depend on the government. Mm. What we are trying to do is our citizens to be more independent, but we have to teach we have to provide the connectivity, the support that will allow them to reach this kind of freedom. And so uh, we are reinforces in this moment, uh, this pandemic uh, show us the inequality that we are facing right. everywhere, in all the, not, not just for the people with disability. So we are finishing our diagnosis what areas are facing or are lacking look of this uh, connectivity mm. and, we, what, and asking what do we have to do in order to solve. So later on, developing the infrastructure to continue and to provide these connectivity services. And third, the mobility and safety is the three main uh, challenge that we are facing in, in during this pandemic. Got it. Uh, Professor Trevi Ranis, you just heard what the mayor said. He talks about connectivity. He talks about providing free internet. Do you think free internet is one of the primary things that uh, needs to be made available? And I also wonder in the context of that, um, do you think that there's been a gap in terms of um, access to education during this COVID period uh, between developed versus developing countries and in what ways? Yeah, I, I, given that education is a right and if education can only be achieved through the internet, then I think it, internet should be a human right and it should be something that is freely available to everyone within a country. It's, it's quite interesting to compare what is happening in different countries. I think any country that has developed a cohesive community where there isn't as great a disparity is faring much better. And I, I don't think it's divided um, as it would be expected because one of the things that we're seeing in more well-off countries that seem to have strong infrastructure is uh, there are some steps that are being taken where technology is relied upon, technology that is uh, that enforces conformance and standardization and assumes that everyone is going to have internet, that, that everyone can use the same type of technology. And that I, I think is, uh, We've talked a lot about how to address issues with technology, but there are a lot of risks that come from adopting technology that isn't thinking about the diverse needs of students. So one example that we have is um, proctoring systems. And certainly students around the world are experiencing this where the assessments for entry into, in, into academic programs are um, relying upon artificial intelligence systems and proctoring systems that require students to sit in front of a camera, keep their hands on a keyboard, not gaze away from the computer, et cetera. And, and if any of those things are done, and often those need to be done if you have a disability, then you are marked as someone that is cheating. Mm. Um, instructional tutors are being adopted, which are which require very sophisticated hardware, good bandwidth, and which also um, expose students to um, many of the uh, commercial technologies that then um, shape students towards a single conformant uh, way of learning. Um, and these are, are very unfortunate because I think one of the amazing things or one of the silver linings of this disruption or this discontinuity in education is it gives us a chance to think about where do we want to take education? Is the model of education that we have in many formal education systems actually going in the right direction, given what the future of work is, given what we've learned about um, all of our 
uh, systems, our economy, our cultural systems, etc. It's it provides this opportunity to pause and think. What is it that we need? And if there's one lesson um, within the pandemic, is that uh, we uh, we are diverse. Um, the the ability to support the the human diversity that is within our communities is what is shoring us up. We, we have a um, an upside down to some extent value system where the workers that we thought were so valuable are actually not the workers that were so valuable, where the humane and human skills are the, the more important. And so we have an opportunity, this, this window of opportunity during this pause where a lot of the things are disrupted to rethink a whole range of things. And of course, education prepares the next generation. It's the thing that is going to um, allow us to survive this crisis and the next crisis. So let's take this lesson and rethink how we're educating and support the human diversity and certainly people with disabilities know the the um, the cracks in the system they're the, the most vulnerable to much of what is going wrong at the moment and they also have an experience of what it would take to uh, uh, survive this the resourcefulness mm -hmm. the innovation these unexpected things that happen to you all the time if you have a disability so um, I think we need to rethink and use this particular pause. Thank you so much. At this point, um, I want to go to a question that has one of the uh, few questions that have been sent in. Um, there was a question in regards to uh, what uh, Professor Chambers was talking about, um, asking if we can expound on the open education resources, what that actually is. Why don't I go to Professor Tate to, um, to explain if you could provide an example um, for someone who's not familiar with what that is. And if you can unmute. Could you just amplify that question slightly? Uh, yes, I mean, there was a question from the audience about open education resources and if, mm. if it can be expounded in terms of what that actually is. Uh, I think a, a, an example would be helpful for people. Yes, well, uh, uh, I mean, there are a whole range of open education resources developed over the last perhaps 10 years around the world with some great pluses and some challenges. I mean, the great majority in the English language uh, rather than a range of languages, although that is being improved uh, in, in the recent three years, perhaps in particular. Um, and while these resources are of vital importance, being open and accessible and free to everybody, including students with disability, um, it's also true that in many cases adjustments have not been made. It have not been made for students who do have particular kinds of disabilities. So I think there is work to be done in OERs. And I think if we if we look at the UNESCO guidelines on um, on um, including um, learners with disabilities, um, we can see I think that we need to move in in their guidelines. They really move us to open education practices, and I must say I think it's timely to stop thinking about open education resources as a thing out there, and rather look at the practice of of using open education resources. What's what's commonly known as open education practice, which will take us of, of course to making sure that those resources are available to all our sorts of users, all people who learn. Um, could you, um, just in case there are those who are not familiar, uh, are OERs, is it like a curriculum? Like if I wanted to learn history, I'd be able to access a, a semester of curricula on that, just as an example? Yes, uh, so many, many education institutions, particularly higher education institutions have put their courses online. And some of those courses are quite difficult to access and to understand. Others are very accessible and approachable. And they can range from simple undergraduate and master's level courses to informal learning. I mean, the, the Open University UK's uh, open learn space has a wide range of open, of informal learning opportunities, mm. which, which, are, which actually millions of people have taken advantage of. It's a remarkable uh, achievement. Um, so they're, 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 they're really, uh, it's really a movement against the commoditization of knowledge behind publishers' paywalls. Uh, and it, it goes out from open education resources to open publishing 
uh, open software, a whole range of anti-commoditization measures, which that mean is. that re resources are there to share. And Professor Chambers, and you look like you wanted to uh, say something. Yeah, yeah, sorry, and I was I, just I going to like the fact. Oh, sorry. I, I, no, that's okay. Um, so I, I was just going to say, yes, uh, the open educational resource is definitely part of open and distance learning. So it's not something that doesn't stands alone, but it's also part of that free and open source software. So one comment I wanted to make was that a, a lot of the open education resources may not be accessible. And there's ways that you can check that. So there's, you know, web accessibility checkers and, and different th tools that you can use to actually determine whether or not a resource is appropriate for a particular group of students or a, a particular individual. So there are ways to ensure that people know that. One thing that's really important around it is education. And that's education of the um, end users, but also education of the teachers, lecturers, professors, people who are setting those courses. So one thing um, I know that the, the UNESCO recommendations were, was building that capacity. And for me, that's a big thing because a lot of, we've noticed a gap um, between teachers' abilities to actually use some of those resources. And that, that gap has meant that some schools and institutions have put champions in place. And those champions are the people who can access and understand the technology and can work with people to make sure that they're accessible. So that's one strategy that, that has been really useful in this current climate. And uh, yes, Professor Trevoranis, yes. Yeah, and I, I like the emphasis on um, open practices because one of the other opportunities is to engage students in actually creating curriculum. So uh, an example that we're using is we're working with an indigenous colleges and universities whereby students are um, capturing the missing indigenous knowledge within their communities or um, the, the opportunity for uh, parents or uh, community members and multi-generational groups to add the missing accessible uh, aspects of a particular resource. I think the, the true uh, potential of open education is not just that it's not going to, you don't need to pay for them, but that um, they can be a students, teachers, communities of learners can participate in enriching and creating uh, the resources and in adding the perspectives, but also the, the ways of presenting the resources that are missing from the original canonical textbooks, whether it's an open textbook or other online curriculum. So it, it's harnessing um, a, a whole range of resources, not just the, the experts, but also um, helping to refine and address uh, perhaps issues or problems uh, or perspectives that were misrepresented within the resources. Collaboratively yeah, it's very developed. Mm. Oh, go ahead. Oh, so I was just saying collaboratively developed, which is, is part of the whole um, idea around uh, open resources and open education resources. Yeah, I was going to say that there is a thing we've been so focused on students learning that I, it, we should flip it on its head and, and think about uh, the teachers as well and, and look at it from that point of view. Uh, and with that in mind, I want to go to Mr. Bhattacharya. And then there is a question for the mayor next. But first, uh, Mr. Bhattacharya, if you could, I I'd love to hear your thoughts in terms of what they're talking about. Uh, we've been so focused on students learning, but of course, teachers have had to adapt as well. And, and it's clear from the comments of uh, the panelists that they believe that it should really be collaborative between the students and teachers in order uh, to make things work. What are your thoughts? And I think you're on mute again. <laughs> if you can unmute. Ah, I still cannot hear you. Um, can others hear him? No. Try it, mute, uh, unmuting again if you can. Oh, I still cannot hear you. Um, okay, you know what I'll do? I'm gonna hold on to that thought. I'd still love to get your, your thoughts on that. Um, see if we can sort out the, the unmuting in the meantime, and I'll first go to the mayor uh, for the question that somebody posted. Um, it's. Fairly, I think the answer is fairly 
would be fairly short that we can um, go back to Mr. Petajerje in a bit. Um, but the question is in regards to the city of uh, Leon and um, someone said, I would like to ask whether or not there is provision for lending services of computers, laptops, tablets, and smartphones for persons with disabilities. Is that something that your office has considered? As a, as a, as a member of, um, as a municipality of the state of Guanajuato, uh, we have a special program to supply this uh, uh, technology or these uh, tools to our, our students, and especially to our students with disability. Uh, actually, the state government is supplying these uh, uh, tablets for uh, our students, for all our students that belong to the public educational services. So in that, uh, the agreement that we have with the state government is that they are supplying the tablets, the laptops, and as a municipal government, we are providing the services, the free, serv uh, 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 free internet services. So in that way, we are uh, joint efforts to uh, provide the, 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 the tools and the service that the, our students, uh, and especially our students with disability will need. We are opening all the uh, public spaces with this uh, kind of services. So in that way, uh, they can find um, uh, an assessor and, uh, uh, and um, a, a professor, a, a teacher, that will help them in these areas, special areas designed, trying to avoid the, uh, the COVID, but also have the uh, internet access. For instance, we are using the, the, the main building of the municipal government. Mm -hmm. We are using our uh, sport infrastructure. We are using the transportation infrastructure. We are opening, uh, our public spaces with this kind of services. In that way, they are providing the opportunity to have the access to the this uh, uh, the, the to access to the internet, and also with the special programs to provide them the educational services. But uh, we are facing a lot of a, a challenge. It's amazing how many public uh, schools lack of these uh, internet services. Uh, so in this moment we are, and let me say running to con interconnect or connecting all our schools, especially in the rural areas to provide this service. Thank you. I'm going to go back to Mr. Batacherje and see if you can unmute and that the audio works. I cannot hear you. Um, can anyone hear him? No, shake of the head. I hope the UNESCO technical team can take a look at this. Oh, um, I think I think now you can hear me. <laughs> yes, we can. That's fantastic. So I'm um, very sorry about that. Um, you know, no worries, no worries. So the question was, so the question was about um, looking at it from the teacher perspective. What has uh, been needed to adapt? And I do realize that we're getting on to the. Uh, we only have a few more minutes before our hour is done. So if I can ask you about the teacher perspective, um, and then and then a final thought from each of you. So, um, Mr. Bachacherje, in addition to the uh, teacher perspective, I'd love your thoughts on what you see the next trend in technology is for persons with disabilities. And that's the question I'm going to ask each of you um, as okay. a final thought as well. Okay, thank you very much. I think you already realize as a visually impaired person, I am struggling to use this technology. In our country, uh, there is not enough training facilities for the teachers. So they are really thrown in a challenge. They have given technologies, they have given uh, a smartphone or uh, internet. They have purchased some time but they were struggling to use these types of technology. Even though there was an open um, a learning opportunity, we have a e-learning platform, it's called Muktopart. Teachers are trained from that Muktopart uh, web portal, but still there is a challenge, mm. especially teachers with disabilities really face challenge. And another biggest challenge was like, especially schools, 
which are really not highly connected with the technology. That is another biggest challenge we, our teachers has faced. And another issue is like that the mainstreaming schools who always say no to children with disabilities. They were given orientation to uh, present their classes in channel, television channel and different social media such a way that children with disabilities can understand. That is also a challenge because the, in, the, in the normal time, they never ever consider that children with disabilities can be their student. But now they need to think about that. So still there is lots of um, gaps and also um, knowledge gap, skills are also a challenge and technology also a challenge. Um, really, I can say, um, even though we are trying our level best, but still there is far away to go. And Thank one thing I tell you, like we need some kind of inclusive design concept mm. where we don't need to develop something separate for the children with disabilities. We can go with the whatever mainstreaming uh, books or technology available, we can use it. Uh, we don't have good quality text to speech. So there is challenge, but still we are trying to overcome all of this. So it's the inclusive design concept that you think um, needs to be really put front and center next. Uh, same question, um, again, maybe about a minute per answer if possible. Let's go to uh, Professor Chambers. Uh, what do you see as the next trend in technologies for persons with disabilities? I see more mainstream, if you like that word, uh, technologies being developed that incorporate the needs of a variety of people with, with disabilities. And I think universal design for learning and universal design practices, um, which incorporate that inclusive design that you were talking about, um, Vashka, uh, definitely are becoming more mainstream concepts as well. So I can see you know, things being developed that are going to be more usable across a wider range of the population. So that's what I consider to be the main trend that's, that's going ahead. And Professor Alan Tate, your thoughts? Um, yes, just two thoughts quickly, uh, Melissa. One is I think um, that we do have a fight on our hands because students with disability have been an afterthought during the management of education during the pandemic. And I think that's a lot of fight back has got to take place to shift that perception. But the second thing I want to say is that I just want to make a mention of students with mental, with mental health challenges that we shouldn't overlook their needs amongst the range of um, people who need education. And isolation uh, in the pandemic has presented particular challenges for some people with mental health challenges. So I hope they can be included in our discussions in the future. Thank you. Professor Yuta Trevi-Ranus. Hi, yes, and um, I support all of the statements that have been made. I, I think the, the first person that should be considered in designing the technologies are the individuals that cannot use or have difficulty with the current systems. And I think in that way, we're going to design systems that will work for us in the, the crises to come. Um, we need to design things for human difference. I think one issue with technology is we are not designing inclusively. We're thinking about the largest customer base, the average student, the, the typical student, and we're not thinking about the, the human difference that exist and that is where many of the much of the marginalization and disparity is happening and we need to design our education systems as a community effort. Right. Um, we can't just relegate it to teachers or to uh, special services for people with disabilities. I, I agree about, about the integration and mainstreaming and uh, so multi-generational the entire community the community knows the context of the students that are within the community. Mm -hmm. Let's, uh, I, I think we all need to pitch in, um, in terms of education and making sure that no student is excluded from the, uh, reaching their learning potential. And Mayor Hector Lopez Santillana, your thoughts about technology and the future? Integrality is the key issue. We have uh, uh, to focus these problems, this challenge in a multidisciplinary way. We cannot learn or left any single uh, discipline outside of this, uh, this main challenge. Technology is a great opportunity, but it's just a tool. The main focus has to be in the person, in the, in, in the people. So in that way, we have to, to develop solutions as I, as I previously said, 
technology is a great opportunity to reach every uh, other persons that have been left behind before. So using this opportunity, but at the same time, we have to ask uh, 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 different specialists from different disciplines to mm. find a solution. And of, of course, please don't forget the, the politicians. Politicians have a lot of learn. We have to listen to the specialist people in order to find the solutions. Thank you so much to all the panelists who've joined us today. Thank you to the viewers out there who've joined us. In one hour, we'll have a second webinar uh, about sharing your story for development where panelists will share their personal stories. I hope to see you there. And in the meantime, it is coffee break. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Very nice to meet you all of you. Bye-bye. Nice to meet you too. Bye. 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 Bye.